Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special virtual event for the Green County Twin Cities Book Festival 2021. I'm Linda Stack Nelson. I am the managing editor for Rain Taxi. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. Um, and if you don't know much about us yet, you can go ahead and check out our website anytime after the event to learn more. Um, we've got a quarterly print magazine of critical writing and lots of other programs that we put on um, just basically to drive all these wonderful readers watching to where writing is going, which is what these writers do too. So I'm so glad to get to share them with you today. Um, tonight's event, like pretty much all of our events, is free to attend. But if you're able to pitch in a little something, please feel free to use the donate button at the bottom of your screen. Some of the funding for our festival comes from the Minnesota Regional Arts Council and the Minnesota State Arts Board. Um, but the biggest funding that we get comes from you. And as you can see, we have some wonderful ASL interpretation that's been provided by the University of Minnesota Libraries. Um, whether you are a one-time watcher, you're joining us for the first time ever, or you've been a member for many years, we thank you for your support. And anything that you do to support us means the world to our small, independent, weird literary community. Um, and don't forget that while you're watching this wonderful event, there's lots of ways for you to participate. Uh, there's a chat which people are already chiming in on. Feel free to put all of your observations, thoughts, comments there. Um, there's also the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we're going to do some Q&A at the end, if we have time, hopefully. Um, and you can put your questions for the authors down there, and I will relay them as I can. And uh, most importantly, there is the buy the book button. And if you buy the lovely books that we're going to talk about today from our independent book selling partner, Red Balloon Bookshop in St. Paul, you're supporting not only a great indie bookstore, wonderful authors and publishers, but also our festival, which we love putting on every year and we can't do it without your help. Um, so now all of that exciting intro being said, it is my enormous pleasure to welcome the four authors that I have on screen with me today. Alessandra Navarez Varela, it's so wonderful to have you here. Um, and we've got David Levithan and Jennifer Niven and Harmony Becker. So I'm going to start out by just letting each of you say a little bit about your own books. I'm one of my greatest failings as a person who works in books is that I'm very bad at summarizing them. I, I, it's either 50,000 words or five. I'm my, my ability to land in between very low, but we have the experts here, which is why uh, I will hand it over to you first, Alessandra, to tell us about your book. Sure, and so happy to be here and saludos and regards from El Paso Ciudad Juarez Borderland. Uh, well, again, my, my big name, Alessandra Narvaez Varela, uh, and I'm the author of 30 Talks Weird Love. This is a novel in verse featuring Ana Maria. She's a 13 year old girl living in Ciudad Juarez in 1999. The year is very important because it marks, um, well, it doesn't mark, but it happens during the first wave of femicides in Ciudad Juarez, a time I also lived through because I am a native of Ciudad Juarez. Um, so it's not only that there's anxiety and there's fear um, and sadness because we've lost, we've actually keep losing a lot of women and girls, um, but Ana Maria is struggling with depression and of course she doesn't know how to call it that yet. Um, she's also dealing with the complexities of being a girl, um, of having friends who are girls. And as we know, that could be very, very interesting at times. And um, the, I guess the most, um, the, what's, the, what's the word? Impactful event um, that happens in her life currently is meeting her future 30 year old self. So that's what it's about. And as I said, it is a novel in verse. So it features poetry and it has different forms of poetry. It's mainly free verse uh, in couplets or triplets. That just means that you have uh, stanzas of two or three lines. Uh, I also have concrete poetry, which is when you do shapes, right? I have dialogue poems. I have prose poems. Um, and that's pretty much it. This is 30 Talks for Love. And again, very happy to be here. It's absolutely just a, a gorgeous and varied book. I was constantly being surprised and excited about what new things the form of the text was doing, which is, of course, the theme that we're getting into today. Um, but before I get into that, uh, Jennifer and David, do you want to tell us a little bit about your book? 
for David, go right ahead. Sure. I was gonna say that there'll be lots of pauses with Jennifer and I staring at each other to see who goes first. <laughs> All right, the, the title of our book is Take Me With You When You Go. Um, and we wrote it together um, by email, um, Jennifer and I, and that is very fitting because it is the correspondence between a brother and a sister, Ezra and B. And my character, Ezra, wakes up at the beginning and just one morning discovers that his sister is gone. She has run away. Um, and his mother and stepfather are very angry about this. Ezra is very confused. Um, he has not left a note or anything, but he does find an email address from her for only him to use. And so he emails her and says, where are you? What's happened? Um, and very much that was also me as an author emailing Jennifer and saying, where is B? What happened? <laughs> and Jennifer took it from there. And we, uh, David and I, when we started writing together, uh, David said, you know, one major rule for us is we never discuss the plot. And so we never discussed the plot. And uh, so as David says, you know, when Ezra receives an email from B, finding out for the first time what B is doing and where she's gone and why, David is finding that out just as B and I found out at the same time what Ezra was doing and what David was doing. It was a very exciting way to write a book. That's so interesting. And it, it gets a little bit into something I am gonna ask about later. So I don't wanna delve on it right this moment because I wanna hear about Harmony's book, but thank you both so much. Harmony, tell us about Himawara House. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be here with all of these super talented authors. My book is called Himawari House. I don't actually have a copy with me yet, um, but it is this, it's a graphic novel and it's the story of three girls, one from the United States with Japanese heritage, one from Korea and another one from Singapore. And they are all living together in a share house um, called Himawari House in Tokyo. And I guess the key point of this book that makes it stand out is that it's multilingual. And uh, the feature that I use to make, to really bring the reader into that feeling of um, immersion is to only add English subtitles when our protagonists actually understand what is being said. Um, so it's a fun way of sort of bringing the reader into that experience of confusion and also like eventual comprehension throughout the course of a year. Yeah, it, it really has a unique, the reading experience of it is very unique, even among graphic novels, which by necessity of how they are drawn are always unique unto themselves. But it's very, it's a very cool experience in terms of the, the physical reading of it. Um, so the, the next question I wanted to ask is, as I said, tangential to what Jennifer and David were talking about, which is about process. Um, obviously, each of these books is fairly unique within the YA novel genre, um, though, of course, has precedence, each of them. Um, but I wanted to hear just from each of you, for anyone who's watching who has not, as I have not written a novel in verse and a graphic novel and a multi-narrator uh, email novel, um, what was the process of creating your book like? How did it evolve? What was a typical day like for you? I'll leave this very open, but I just want to hear firsthand what's the process. And I'll start with Alessandra again. Um, something else that I wanted to mention that Harmony brought up, um, the, the my book is bilingual. Oh my goodness, that's a big thing. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Harmony. It's not multilingual, but it's bilingual. It has English and Spanish, which also reflects uh, my own heritage and experience. I wanted to uh, mention that. And I guess I have to tie that into the process, which is your your question. Um, it all started really on a sleepless night. And let me just show you this really quickly. Uh, I couldn't sleep and I just woke up and started writing in my composition book. And what's interesting to me about that is that it doesn't, it didn't necessarily start as poetry either. Um, I just wrote in prose um, and then, and I still can find the page. Um, and then once I started transcribing what I had gotten in that sleepless night in January, 2019, for some reason organically, because of who I am, my background is in poetry, I started cutting lines. Um, 
So that was the process in the beginning. And this is actually the first, first uh, proto graph of, of 30 cogs for love. And again, you can see the lines, you know, it, they're just pros, regular pros. After that, um, once I was, uh, the manuscript was, was accepted for publication, I just had to balance um, the revision process, which I'd never gone through before, um, while also teaching. So that was a really interesting ask for me. Um, I love to teach and I do believe that without having been a teacher, the book wouldn't have been born because it is an exploration of teenagehood, of which I didn't have much. I was a type A personality, I still am. Um, but meeting different kinds of teenagers and young adults did really give me that chance to think like, what did I go through? Mm -hmm. um, so that helped the revision process a lot. Also reading the, the work from my students, uh, not only poetry, short stories, but even their essays really helped me polish all of my poems. Um, and going back to the bilingual part of it, that uh, was an interesting process as well because part of me wanted to at times have more Spanish, but it is something that I have to balance because the main audience right now is um, an, an, an English uh, speaking and talking audience. And I guess Harmony will have a lot to say about that as well. So that's something that with my editor, I had to talk to a lot. And my editor uh, was Lee Bird. Uh, that was the original press, Cinco Puntos, local here in El Paso. And she has a history of working uh, with writers like myself, but it was, a, again, a, not a push and pull, but a conversation of, if you're gonna include this landmark in Ciudad Juarez or in, in Mexico, then how are you gonna still keep your readership in? Mm -hmm. um, something else that I would like to mention is that the concrete poems, which are again, and let me just find one super fast. I know I'm taking too long. Uh, oh my goodness, that's the first one I marked. Um, the concrete poems, which are just shape poems, right? The restraint mm -hmm. is you have a shape, and this is actually about hopscotch or mama leche. This edition was made very late into the process. That that was. Um, what was it, June 2020? Um, and I just felt like Ana Maria had to have a little bit more fun, but she's a very school obsessed child. So she wouldn't just, you know, go to a party or any, anything else. She would try to experiment and try to find her inner poet because that's another thing that Ana Maria is grappling with. She wants to be a doctor, but she also has this other uh, passion and so, the reason for, and this is the last thing that I'll say, the reason for the form of the book, uh, it being in verse, is that Ana Maria is a poet. So it made sense to have it communicate directly to the reader through poetry and have it to be first person point of view. That's what I'll say. <laughs> it's not too much at all, Alessandra. That's all really fascinating and very cool to know. I honestly, extra cool to me having already read the book, but I'm sure it will really inform people who get the book and today and read it after because that's such an interesting process. So David and Jennifer, you started talking a little bit about sending each other emails and not talking about the plot, but say a little bit more about how this all came to be. Well, I had um, said something on Twitter about which author I would most like to collaborate with. And I said, David Levithan, and he, <laughs> he uh, sent me an email a week later saying, here's something that could be the first chapter of something if you want to do this with me, but we don't talk about the plot. As I said, that was that was the rule. I've never written a book like that before. I am part plotter, part pantser. I think David's a bit, a bit more of a pantser than I am. So it terrified me. Plus I was writing with one of my literary heroes, so there was no pressure there. Um, but it was, I think it was, you know, one of the one of the many things I really loved about it was I felt like we really pushed each other and we kept each other on our toes. And by the, you know, mere point of not talking about it beforehand, we were just as surprised as B and Ezra were, you know, um, and I think that lent hopefully some authenticity to their reactions. Uh, to the material, I mean, to each other and to what they were going through, because we certainly had those reactions to each other. Even, you know, on 
there were times Ezra was mad at B, and I've told David this many times, but you know, I would read it as Jennifer, but also as B, and I would be like, he's mad at me right now. <laughs> so we, you know, took the book very personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and I think I mean I had I had written collaborative books before, but but I had, I guess with the exception of Will Grayson, Will Grayson, my characters and the other authors' characters had always been in the same place. So when you go back and forth, it was you were sharing the same narrative with the characters interacting, and this was the first time where truly the the characters were nowhere near each other. I had no visibility to B's world. Um, B had no visibility to Ezra's world. And so we really were filling each other in. And people have been like, well, the emails are so detailed. Do people really write emails that are that detailed? But we genuinely felt that yes, that, that this brother and sister would because they are trying to trying to tell the other person what's going on. And mm -hmm. they felt very right. Um, the other inadvertent thing, um, which I just checked, I mean, the the events of the book take place in a month and it took Jennifer and I about four years to write the book <laughs> back and forth because every now and then one of us would have another book that was due, a solo book that was due. And so I would email Jennifer and be like, hey, I don't think I'm gonna get to this for the next six months or she would email me and do the same, which you would think would be harmful towards the book, but I actually think in retrospect that it helped the book because we did actually live with our characters much longer than we usually do in writing a book. And and that really did help because it's a brother and sister, there has to be that shared history and that sense that they really do know each other. Mm -hmm. And I think by the time we were getting to the, the last half of the book, I, I think we both felt we had been living with the characters a lot. And I think that comes through in the in the book a lot. Yeah, as someone with a younger brother, I'm not quite as close as B and Ezra are, but it's I definitely felt the like the tension of like love and frustration and like mm -hmm. we understand each other and can communicate in this like intrinsic way, but also the way you communicate makes me want to like pull your eyes out. <laughs> like it's very it felt very uh, authentic as a sibling relationship, and I definitely think that that stewing in those characters probably <laughs> contributed to that. <laughs> Thank you. So Harmony, let's hear a little bit about, obviously a graphic novel process, very, uh, very different. Yeah, um, so Himawari House actually started out as a web comic. Um, I was publishing it on Tapas and Webtoon. Um, and then it got picked up after I had self-published, like just made some print copies and was selling them at comic festivals and things like that. And then it got picked up by first second to become an actual graphic novel. So. Um, Fortunately, I wasn't really, I hadn't done too much thinking about like the webcomic format in a different terms than um, a regular book. So um, there's a lot of webcomics that are just kind of like, you know, you'll have like one panel and then scroll down like a, a while and then there's another panel. But I thankfully didn't have to reformat it too much. I had it more or less in pages. Um, but I think while working on it, or before I started working on it, I think the idea was coming more or less from the idea of um, wanting to keep the nuances that show up when someone is speaking a different language and the different ways that people interact with each other, um, the different relationships that people have with each other in different cultures and different languages. Um, it's difficult, I think, to express that in text. I think the format of a graphic novel made it a little bit easier. I think um, I think originally my idea was to do it as like a series or a television show, but since comics is what I do, that's the first thing that I went to um, because people are more used to subtitles when listening to speech um, that's foreign. Um, but yeah, I, I just really didn't want to lose those nuances. Um, and I mean, there's just so many small things that get lost in translation because other languages have words that we don't have um, or ways of interacting with each other that we don't have, such as in Japanese and Korean, there's a whole other um, format of speech that's used for people who are like a higher rank or older than you that we don't have in English and different ways of even just like saying simple words. If you're saying it to someone who's older than you or who's your boss, you would use different words to talk to them, that sort of thing. Um, that's difficult to 
necessarily translate and I wanted to just keep it on the page, um, even if the reader's not necessarily able to understand it, just to sort of know that there's another way of relating and that it's right there in front of you. So like if you have the curiosity, you can maybe take a step outside of what you know and explore other ways of thinking and other ways of existing that um, you can access through words. So that was the sort of idea behind the book. Um, I wrote about six chapters and then I got picked up for another graphic novel, George Case, they call this Enemy, which was my first like professional graphic novel. So I had, um, I put Himawari House on pause and then did a whole graphic novel and then was able to come back to it with a lot of experience. So that was really great. Um, and it took me about, about from there two years to finish it. Um, it was interesting because writing it, I wrote the whole thing in English text, but kind of like uh, the Japanese bits I wrote in like Romanized, um, just spelled out text. Um, but the Korean bits I wrote in Korean. And then I had a lot of friends come back and like check to make sure that the, the text was um, accurate and not awkward and sounded natural. I had a, a lot of different eyes on it. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of scary to to be writing dialogue, especially in another language. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think my consultants are really, they really did a wonderful job of making sure that everything sounded natural. And so I'm very grateful to them. Well, that I, that layer of the book, certainly in terms of um, the sort of moments where people ask each other under their breath, is this the right word for this? Or um, like it switches to a thought bubble where uh, at, at one point, one of the characters runs into her boss in public and her boss is like, oh, you can call me by my first name. And she suddenly has this crisis where she's like, I don't know how to end this sentence because I don't understand I'm, I'm suddenly not sure which honorific level I'm supposed to be using. And yeah. it's just, it's so perfectly encapsulates the sort of hilarious awkwardness and like humanness of trying to communicate um, yeah. across languages, but just in general. And I thought it was, it was very um, unique and s sort of magical in that way. So, Thank you. <laughs> um, so, what I was, <laughs> I was telling one of my friends about working on the, uh, on the questions and books for this panel, and I was explaining all of them. Somebody was like, those books sound very, very different. <laughs> and <laughs> I was like, you know, they are in a certain way. But the more I, you know, I wanted to do this panel because I think that YA as a genre is really expanding and changing and has grown exponentially uh, in the last 15, 20 years even. Um, but there's a lot of thematic elements that actually are really similar among the books as well. And the one that I wanted to talk about first and foremost is that all the books are in a way about family and place and the way that family and place relate to each other, the way that changing the place that you are changes your relationship to yourself, to your family or doesn't. Um, and so I, I want to talk a little bit about that as a, a thematic tie together, because I really think that the age that YA is for and um, Alessandra's protagonist is 13 and the, uh, the protagonists for the rest of your books are either about to be out of high school or slash just out of high school and then 15. So we've re we're really running the gamut on uh, protagonist ages here. But I think that in all these, it, at all of those points in your teenage years, you think a lot about where you live and where you want to live after you're done <laughs> being a teenager <laughs> and about your family and how you feel about your family and how you relate to them or don't. Um, and so I think that those are really like core questions of teenagerhood that all of your books get at. And I just love to hear sort of how you think about it, how you feel like you related it through your protagonist, et cetera, et cetera. So Alessandra, I'll start with you again. So, and what you say, it obviously resonates, but I feel for me, because this this novel is semi-autobiographical, um, that it took for me to be 30-something to actually think about my family and the place that I come from as being super uh, important, forceful 
um, influences in my life. I think that sometimes when you're in it, you don't really are not able to process it or digest it in my experience, because my world was all about school and getting yeses or A's or making the honor roll or getting to the next place, graduating with honor, deciding my future at 13 years old or more. Um, I was not aware of, of how much my parents shaped me and my city shaped me. So I'm really thankful for your question because of that. It, it really took many years for me to think and, and I know a lot of us might dedicate our first books to our parents, but for me, it was really important. Um, and it says right there, um, my parents' name, names are Carlos and Amanda, and I want everyone to know their names because without them, I wouldn't be here. Uh, they also, um, for some reason, and I don't know why, they're both public accountants, but my earliest memories of them at a job was always having a restaurant. I don't know why, it's so difficult owning a restaurant. So they had several taquerias in Ciudad Juarez and then they made the move to El Paso. Uh, they have a restaurant called Los Colorines and they had it for 20 something years. And I say Los Colorines because actually in the novel, uh, the taqueria for Ana Maria's parents is called El Colorín, right? So this was really a celebration of who my parents are um, and just all the, sacrifice that they had to make and something that a lot of people don't understand about living in the border. When we lived in Ciudad Juarez, my parents, uh, first my dad would have to get up three, four in the morning to then cross the, the border. Uh, <clears throat> regrettably, after the events of 9-11, things got, got really out of hand. Um, I think my mom got stuck in line for five hours, she said, to actually make it to work. Um, and so, Again, I'm, this is, the book is a celebration of that sacrifice and that relationship. At the same time, um, I went through, through a, a, different, uh, a difficult period that is also explored in this, in this novel, which is struggling with depression, but also suicidal uh, ideation and attempt. And in my case, I never spoke about it because I was on the run. It's like, you work, you work, you work. Your parents work, you work. And I was born like that. My parents never told me to be a type A. Um, but I wanted to revise history, if you will, and have Ana Maria talk to her parents about this. And in this book, I give my parents the chance to help me. Because when that happened in real life, I just, I think I wrote a really, a really uh, negative note when I attempted um, um, to take my life. Um, and my mom actually read my diary. I don't even, it, it doesn't, it didn't even have a little lock, but she found it for some reason. And what she did with the tools that she had was write me the most beautiful note and tell me that everything was gonna be all right. And I remember in this note that I wrote, um, I had items like one through maybe 50 of all the things that were wrong with me. And my mom actually took the time to respond to each item and say, you're, you're not as bad as you think. In fact, because she's my mom, you're great. Um, so I think that that is something very, very important to the novel, um, to explore that relationship, which, is, which can be very tense. And Ana Maria, unlike me, finds the way to talk to her parents, but of course they had to use something, which is this 30 year old who comes from the future and visits her and says, talk to them, really talk to them and really, 30, and that's the nickname of this future self, or tells her, just use these words, tell them you're not doing okay, tell them this and that. And again, that's something that I don't have and that teenagers overall don't have. Um, so that's it. Uh, as far as the place, it has taken me a long time to understand the complexity of the love that I have for my city. Um, it has a bad rap overall. Um, the city of the kill girls and it's an ongoing thing right um there's a, a wonderful podcast that explores this and started calling it waves right so 1999 thereabouts first wave right now we're in the third wave so this is ongoing so how do you um celebrate that love but also recognize that it's so so complex um and i think see that quite has becomes a character 
uh, as it as it does for many other books. Uh, and Ana Maria goes through the through the phases of I love my my city. Everyone thinks it's this, this, this. I love it. And then once something very tragic happens in the book, she starts hating the city, not recognizing the love. And then later on, it comes to I think at a point where I'm at, where it's uh, I recognize the flaws, but I recognize the love and the pride that I have for the city. Who uh, and I say who because I do see it as a as a person, as a mother that has gone through so many things. And the people of Ciudad Juarez are very resilient, uh, hardworking, and we're just trying. Um, so those are the relationships with family and with, with place. And that, again, was also related to the theme of the femicides, which was very difficult for me to tackle and not sensationalize, uh, because that's what happens with murdered women, especially murdered women of color. Um, so I wanted to have young adults, adults, uh, start this conversation as well. And um, because related to the place, do that quite as there's also our girls and women. So that's what I try to do in, in terms of family and place. Well, and I, I really think that the, I can't say it's realistic because I don't have personal experience from which to say that, but the, the ways in which you show Ana Maria thinking about and being um, uh, preoccupied with this continued wave of femicides, but also having homework and drama with her friends and like normal, uh, you know, high school things that when you are living through uh, what turns out to be a historical and community tragic event, you are still, you have English essays to turn in, you know? Um, you have to figure out who you're gonna sit with at lunch. And um, that balance can be very difficult to strike, but I think you struck it very, very beautifully, so. David and uh, Jennifer, do you wanna talk a little bit about family in place? Well, I think, I mean, one of the, the great ironies of this book is that Jennifer and I both have deeply loving supporting parents and grew up in deeply loving supporting homes um but in this case with bns we really are exploring what it's like to be in the opposite to, to be in a house where where it is openly hostile towards you um and b and ezra have different reactions to this um b is pretty much the lightning rod and and ezra has lived in the shadows and then when b disappears Ezra suddenly is in is the light, the new lightning rod, and B actually gets to experience life for the first time, not being the lightning rod, and I think that was really interesting for us to explore the the getting away and left behind dynamics of a broken family, um, and how both options, whether it is choosing to leave or having to stay, you still have to navigate and and. Our book is nothing if not a navigation manual about how to get through that period and to basically stand up for yourself. And and it's interesting because I don't I don't think specific place is actually at all important for our book. I mean, it, it, specifically, I think it's more important for B because you actually get a sense of where she is, and I don't really want to give that away here. But for Ezra, I mean, his home, their town could be any town in America. I mean, and, and that is very deliberate on our part. We really didn't want to to specify because it is such a universal experience. And when you're trapped, it really doesn't matter where you're trapped because your world doesn't really live much wider than your home. And so so that for Ezra, I think, was the, the feeling that we wanted of the house itself and sort of the, the neighborhood that you're living in is the, the, the place where you are trapped. And again, it is on the one hand about escape from that. And then the other hand, again, I don't want to give up. I don't want to give Ezra's full arc away here, but he obviously does have to learn how to stand up for himself against this hostile, this, this hostile stepfather and very passive, potentially hostile mother. And I think just to add to that, you know, we, for us, the the real sense of home in the book is Ezra and B's relationship, and I think that you know they've always been at home with each other, 
you know, even as their own home is not really a home in a lot of ways. Um, but they've always had that safety and love with the, you know, between the two of them. And so now that they're separated in this book, it's it's very scary. And um, I think they realize even more uh, that they're each other's home in a way that they didn't fully get before. Mm -hmm. Harmony, what about uh, what about in yours? Um, sort of piggybacking off of what Jennifer said, I think that's also a similar um, experience to what my characters go through in Himawari House. All of them, of course, are living in a different country um, and have come there for different reasons. Um, Tokyo is, I think, a notoriously unwelcoming city. And especially in the case of Nao, who is, has Japanese heritage, but um, left Japan as a small child and grew up in the United States. Um, she grapples especially with the idea of having grown up thinking of Japan as her home, but now that she also is someone who has um, Caucasian heritage as well, so doesn't appear fully Japanese, um, coming back to Japan, not speaking as fluently as she did as a child and realizing that this place that she thought of as home now no longer considers her as one of their own and um, the difficulty of sort of grappling with that, um, what's the word, sort of um, contradictory way of looking at herself versus the way that other people see her and coming to terms with that. Um, as well as Hejong, my Korean character has sort of arc of uh, giving up on her family's expectations of her and sort of running away to Japan um, and then sort of creating a bit of a makeshift family with her roommates in Japan. So that's a big um, theme, I think, that goes throughout the book of sort of creating um, an island, if you will. Um, and not, not just like with the relationships that you have, but also sort of an island where, you know, there's the experience of being the only ones who can understand what you're saying at the restaurant and nobody else can become a part of that or just having somebody to come home to at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, I think that all of their relationship with the idea of family changes a little bit from beginning to end, um, as well as the idea of home and place and the relationship. Hejong also experiences this sort of feeling of once um, the once you leave the place where there were so many expectations put upon you, you suddenly feel weightless and you feel like you can become a different person, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of physical place and also I think in terms of language, um, there's a big theme of sort of being able to recreate yourself when um, in another language, when suddenly the personality traits that you put into your language or the restraints of your language are suddenly completely different and you can expand in different ways that maybe you hadn't considered before or you have to contract yourself in different ways and just how that affects who you are as a person. Um, mm -hmm. That was something that I really wanted to explore. Well, that's uh, that's very interesting. And in a way it leads into the, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which has to do with world building which is something that we often apply to sort of fantasy or science fiction, like fantastical uh, types of books more so than realistic books, which for, you know, plus or minus a 30 year old time traveler, these books mostly are realistic. Um, but Alessandra and Harmony, you were both writing about places that your uh, large chunk of your audience, you did not expect them to necessarily have a full concept of coming into your book. And Jennifer and David, you're writing about a family situation and in some later parts in which I will not spoil anything of places as well that people may not be familiar with and that you two weren't familiar with as David mentioned. Um, so how did, you, I'd like to just hear a little bit about like how you wanted to craft the worlds that you were showing your readers and uh, what, how you, how your concept came into that and how you executed it and whether that surprised you in any ways. You can go ahead, Alessandra. I'm just gonna okay, keep yeah, starting with you. Wanna... Yeah, no, I don't wanna. <laughs> so, and something that again, Harmony reminded me of is this loss in translation, which actually can happen in the border. Um, some people who haven't visited imagine that we're just, and that would be ideal that we can just 
um, talk all the time in Spanish and English, and we do to a certain extent, but it doesn't always happen. So I think that something that Harmony made me realize, and again, thank you, is that in this book, I created a sort of bilingual utopia because um, Ana Maria is, is talking in, in writing, talking to us mostly in English, and then she has Spanish. And although I do help the reader um, understand certain sayings and certain words, it's, it's just, it's a given. This is the way they, these kids communicate with each other. And again, it's not always a reality. And I think that it should be, especially where we are, because we're so fortunate to have a meeting of cultures and languages. So that's one thing that um, it just happened. It happened really organically. I want to have this, this place of linguistic and cultural wealth. And it is in Ciudad Juarez. And something that is that is uh, that I didn't explore is the comings and goings, right? Because then that would be very different. Uh, but I wanted to stay in Ciudad Juarez and have this bilingual utopia that is actually um, contrasting what is happening in, in the city itself. More than the city, which I've spoken uh, um, more about, is the school itself. The school is based on my own experience of going to um, to a, a private school my parents were very hard to pay for, but it was almost military. Um, <laughs> um, they it, it was all about a cuadro de honor, the honor roll, and, and where you placing in there. We couldn't run during recess. We couldn't wear um, jewelry. We couldn't have our hair down. Uh, we would have hygiene checks with our little like um, handkerchief, our nails, our polished shoes. Uh, and it's really um, surreal to think about it when I talk to my friends. It's like we went through that and it was real. And also the, the, the big pressure that they put in academics, how it affected our lives. So I wanted that to be very present in the world um, of Ana Maria because a lot of us who go through this kind of academic experience, we don't really grapple with the consequences until later. It's like, oh yeah, I recognize you because you're a little bit um, nervous in type A. And once we left that school in Ciudad Juarez, some of us did keep to that very strict uh, sense of, of uh, discipline and, and obligation and achievement. And some of us actually broke free because we were tired of being um, held so tightly and always being expecting excellence and excellence and excellence. So it was really important for me to revisit my middle school. And I actually had to draw a part of it where a very important scene happens because this middle school is connected to another building. Um, but this this bridge is not completed. Uh, and so that is a place where several things are bound to happen. One of them that I will reveal because I think it's really funny and it actually did happen is that it was, it was the elementary, it was the bridge, and then it was the middle school. But again, we weren't allowed to go in there because it was not finished. But someone was so afraid um, to face the subdirectora, the vice principal, because they didn't have the homework, that they actually found a way to escape through a gap that was there. Um, and so that happens in the book, actually. And I can't <laughs> believe it happened. We were just so scared of them. Uh, and even when I saw the subdirectora, the vice principal, later, and I was much taller than her, I still felt like this. Uh, <laughs> So that was, that was very important to me to revisit my middle school um, and go from Juan de Dios Pesa, which was the real name to Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz, which is um, you know a celebration also of the greatest uh, female poet in, in Mexico and someone who was very subversive in, in, her, in her ways of, of writing, but also what she did, right? To go through, um, to want to study, but have to make the commitment to nunnery. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did in, in, in the terms of building that world besides you, that quad is that's also, as you said, Linda, like that microcosm that we are, we're in in teenagers, which is our middle schools or our high schools and the friends and the people that are there. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I, it becomes even, you know, obviously uh, 
by volume of language, a novel in verse is much smaller than a novel in prose. Um, but there is such a, a rich and wide world that you built there. And it's really, really amazing to be able to visit. Um, Jennifer and David, talk a little bit about your, your world building. I think, you know, one of the, I mean, as David was saying, in building the worlds of being Ezra, I mean, David and I are very fortunate to come from very different backgrounds, you know, than from the ones that B and Ezra come from in terms of our families. But we've also had the opportunity to talk to so many teens around the world and hear from so many teens around the world through our previous books. And I think that, you know, that um, was such a part of building the worlds of B and Ezra, just the, um, the stories that have been shared with us over the past few years of you know the, just the universal need to be seen and loved and to know that you matter to know that you're not alone to know that you're not the only person going through whatever it is you're going through and um for me i think you know and i think david's like this too one of the most important parts of the world building that we do is is um you know showing a story, telling a story that is very raw and very honest and deals with these kind of raw, honest issues, but we do it as responsibly as possible. And um, we speak to those readers, you know, without being preachy, we'd like to to give them that message that you're not alone. And so that I think is, is a huge part of the world building that went into this one and has gone into our other um, books as well. And you know, it's interesting too for me just to write a sibling story because I'm an only child. And then we also come from the backgrounds that, that David and I have talked about. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the things that, that we do also is share with people who, you know, after the book is written or while the book is being written, we share with people who have gone through similar things. My husband has gone through very similar experiences um, as B and Ezra, and he was a great first reader for me just to make sure that everything reads as authentically as possible. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the many parts of world building. So world, world building takes so many different shapes and forms. And um, I think for me, that's personally, that's where I always start. Yeah. And, and I, I would go so far again, not, not to dispute the question. Cause I, I do, I do think world building especially when you have a very specific place is just as important in, in realistic fiction as it is in fantasy. But I do think in this particular case with our book, we were actually deliberately trying to do as little world building as possible so we could do world sharing instead that we really, we did view our characters as living in the world of our readers um, and that it, we wanted it to be as accessible as possible again, by, by making it, especially in terms of where Ezra is, as generic as possible, um, because we wanted that relatability and we wanted them to feel in the world of the reader. Um, and again, entirely, as Jennifer said, because at this point in our careers, we are very aware of the worlds that our readers live in. Um, and we want to sort of talk to them in the place where they live rather than ask them to come to the place where we live in order to talk. And so I think this book in particular, that is what we were trying to do. And, and it was very easy for us to think of them as teenagers because again, of, of the number of teenagers that we hear from and who we empathize with and care about um, in their reactions to our previous books. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, every book is its own world in a way. And even though um, Ezra especially is not tied to a geographical location so much, there definitely, um, there becomes a texture of the world that he lives in right. through the through the narration um, that I think is, is really fascinating to discover alongside, uh, alongside the many discoveries about B, of course, as well. Yeah. Um, Harmony, a little bit about uh, your world building concept. Yeah, I struggled with this a lot um, because of the amount of different cultural references and cultural backgrounds that appear in the book. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know that like when 
any person tries to write from an experience that isn't their own, it's going to involve some amount of imagination. But you can never know what your blind spots are. Um, so I was very nervous in writing, especially the parts um, in Korea and in Singapore, because those are not my cultural backgrounds. I have lived in Korea and I've been to Singapore, but that's a completely different thing. And um, especially knowing how much that place and culture can influence the way that you think. Um, I was nervous that possibly the things that I was pointing out as a foreigner were things that would be you wouldn't point out if you were Korean or Singaporean because, you know, it's just something that you take for granted. And there's always like that gap in our vantage points that I was um, really struggling a lot or just very conscious all the time of and nervous that I was going to get it wrong or that somebody was going to to tell me like, oh, it's not actually like that. And like, it's very obvious that you're not like from this culture. But it's like, I think, um, yeah, at the end of the day, this being a project that was written only by one person, it's sort of inevitable that I can only write from uh, my own perspective and just try to as much as possible to stretch my imagination and to consult with people and make sure that everything does sort of, um, makes sense uh, in, a, in their cultural context and that I'm not um, exaggerating something. I, I do remember once having a Japanese reader um, in Tokyo read the first couple of chapters and um, they said that it was really interesting to see Tokyo viewed from like a foreigner's perspective. And I took that personally at the time and I was like, I'm an outsider, but like, yeah, of course you're an outsider, you're not from Tokyo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which is like sort of the thing that now struggles with throughout the book is this idea of like, no, I'm from here. And it's like, are you? <laughs> but like near the end, it's sort of like, well, who cares if you're not from here? You know, mm -hmm. it's it's you decide where your home is and you you don't need other people's permission to um, to take up space where you are. So mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting because I was, when listening to David and Jennifer, I feel like I had almost the opposite approach in, instead of trying to come to readers where they are, I wanted to pull readers to the other side of the world and um, just throw them into an experience that maybe they had no reference points for whatsoever and just make that, um, yeah, just kind of see how people reacted to that. <laughs> Well, it turns out to be a great time, in my opinion. It's uh, all, one thing that in all of this very um, serious and important like craft and background talk we've skimmed over a little bit is that all of these books are really beautiful and really important, but also all of them are very funny at times. They're very um, like the experience of reading them while it feels important afterward while i'm reading them i really just feel like i get to be part of these characters lives and um, that balance is really a, an amazing thing to get to see um, i've talked to you all selfishly about my questions for a very long time and so i'm going to try to get to some reader questions um, some audience questions and we're just going to do like a lightning round basically with audience questions so uh, somebody has asked, what inspires you the most to continue writing? Which is a big question, but I'm, no, I know, no, you have to do the lightning. I'm going to make you. So fast inspiration, Alessandra. Service. I want to serve my readers. And that, that means for me, creating worlds where your students and readers can see mirrors and windows service. Wow. Beautiful. Okay. Yes. Jennifer. Um, I would say the same thing. I mean, I write I write for me because I love writing and it's the thing that I do best. I can't not write. And then also I just, you know, I love writing for readers, especially for young adults. I've written for adults before and I find young adults to just be the best audience for reading. David, what inspires you to keep writing? Yeah, I mean, again, just to, to provide those navigation guides and to, to say that Adolescents and the teen years can really suck and can be really, really hard, but you do make it through and, and there are better places. And I, I think that if a book can help you get to that better place, what, what better reason to write a book? Um, I would say communication. Um, 
I, the times that I felt the most um, just connected and seen and just really uh, fulfilled in reading a book is when I see something articulated that I always thought but didn't necessarily have the words for and realizing that and seeing that in somebody else I think is a form of communication that um, is really unique to writing and really beautiful and I don't know if uh, well my hope is to be able to do the same thing for other people so that is why I write. Okay next quick question did the pandemic lockdown influence the shape and form of your books and if so how? So I'll, I'll go ahead as, as fast as, as possible. Um, I mentioned that the concrete poems were actually written during June 2020. And that was because I was in lockdown. And it did shape it because Ana Maria was trying to have fun. I was trying to have fun. <laughs> I could understand uh, the world of the book and her world a little bit better. So in that sense, it did shape my book at all a lot. Also, I was supposed to travel that during that summer and because that wasn't possible, it did uh, have an influence because I had actually, it was sad to not travel, but I had the, the time and the space, luckily, which not a lot of people have to do so. Mm -hmm. All right, Jennifer. I think that, you know, it did and it didn't. I, I definitely know it, it impacted a lot of my writing, but for this book, I think, you know, I, I think that we, we finished the book during the pandemic time and, as David said, we had started years before, um, but I think that, you know, if anything, it, it helped me be a little um, more in there with B, pay deeper attention to her, and also really relate to some of the isolation that I think both she and Ezra feel in the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, I, I, again, I don't think it, it affected this book but the next book i chose to write was like the most joyous happiest middle grade <laughs> book i could think of to write and i think there is a direct line between <laughs> the pandemic and where my head was at and what i chose to write there because i was like let's okay let, let, let's create some light here in this very dark time yeah we're gonna need a happy space for a minute yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> harmony I think I had almost the opposite reaction. While the book was already mostly written by the time the pandemic started, it, I was starting to illustrate it at that point. Um, but I feel like rather than the lockdown affecting the book, the book uh, carried me through the lockdown mm -hmm. um, because it was just, my focus was just completely on that. And it just brought me like out of the chaos of everything that was going on outside and just into a space where it's like, this is all that's going on and just focusing on that. And once I finished the book, I didn't realize at the time, but now looking back on it, I kind of lost that lifeline and I got really depressed. So um, it was really um, sort of a, a lifeline for me to be able to have the experience of the book to kind of ground me during that time. Well, I think a, a lot of, I know I ha had a similar experience. I think a lot of readers and writers really did um, envelop themselves in the worlds of books to uh i i've my number one thing that i discovered i love about books over the last year of the many that i've known throughout my life but the last year i realized that the notifications cannot get me when i am in a book um mm -hmm. as long as i'm not reading it on you know my phone or my computer but when i'm reading they can't find me i cannot get any news from the new york times while i'm reading a book no one can tell me new information that is not in the book mm -hmm. um and so these have all been wonderful books that i feel so lucky to have gotten to read and to talk to you all about um i hope that many of the people watching us will go and purchase these books from red balloon bookshop and also get to immerse yourselves in these other worlds in these characters and to take a break from <laughs> the sometimes <laughs> extremely uh, stressful and continuing pandemic-y world that we all live in. Um, but that I think is our time and I thank you so much everybody for um, being with us today, for talking to me about your wonderful books. I hope that all of the folks out there who buy and read these books will then get to visit you someday at an in-person event. But for now, it was wonderful to see your digital faces. Um, and as we close, uh, I do want to remind everybody that we have other great festival events coming up, some virtual ones next week and in-person ones next weekend, if you're in the Twin Cities. Um, we'll put a link in the chat for you to check those out. 
And uh, I do want to thank our media sponsors as well, um, Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, Minnesota Public Radio, the Star Tribune, and Twin Cities Public Television, as well as, again, the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council and the Minnesota State Arts Board, all of whom support us so wonderfully. Thank you. And thank you to everyone watching for your support as well. Whether you can donate, buy a book, or you just joined us and contributed your lovely thoughts to the chat, we appreciate it so much. Thank you all and have a great rest of your weekend. Gracias. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.